Yeah, so uh, officially welcome to the afternoon session. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Karl Landsteiner from IFT Madrid, and he's going to talk about transport from gravitational transignments terms. Please. Can you hear me? Does it work? Okay, so first I would like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this uh, conference and for inviting me. Uh, does it work now? Yeah? Hello? Hi, yeah. I can hear myself, so it's all. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so I will talk about, um, uh, yeah, you will see uh, transignment terms in ADS and what you can learn for transport from transignment terms. Um, that's the outline of my talk. I will start giving a very brief review on the theme of anomalous transport. So these are transport coefficients that are induced by quantum field theory anomalies. And then I will give three examples where you can... Uh, make up some holographic models and try to learn something from holography um, in, in the subject of anomalous transport. Okay, so this is uh, probably unnecessary <laughs> here to recall. Why we are here, that's anti the sitter space with a black hole. So I, I think I don't have to explain that. And uh, it all started out probably some 10 years ago uh, when people modeled the uh, core chloro plasma as it's created in heavy ion collisions at RIC and now at LHC by something much simpler uh, following this uh, role model of how theoretical physicists work uh, and replacing the complicated system in nature by something simple in mathematics which happens to be a black hole in onto the sitter space and, and the big success story was that you get this universal coefficient, this universal ratio of shear viscosity to entropy ratio of 1 over 4 pi. And that's not only a nice mathematical result, it turns out that actually uh, the input which you have to give to hydrodynamic simulations in order to reproduce data in heavy ion collisions, uh, the input for, the, for this transport coefficient, the shear viscosity, uh, is, seems, has to be very close to 1 over 4 pi. And now, <coughs> so there's this conjecture that this is sort of a quantum limit of entropy to uh, you know, viscosity to entropy ratio. And, and recently, I think also, also in solid state that plays a big role and strongly coupled uh, electronic systems might have a similar uh, viscosity to entropy ratio. But my talk is actually about something even better. <clears throat> so in, in my talk, that assumption isn't really necessary. It turns out that the point cow approximation works equally well. <clears throat> and that has to do with the fact that uh, anomalies are, of course, sort of related to some deep topological properties of quantum field theories. And it doesn't matter. You can calculate uh, anomalies at weak coupling, at strong coupling. They are not renormalized. They're always the same. And it turns out even these transport coefficients are the same at strong and at weak coupling. So now you might ask why, why I'm doing holography. Uh, because it turns out that uh, doing uh, anomalies have uh, the reputation of being uh, very subtle in quantum field theory. And this is, uh, uh, there's a reason for that. It is indeed very subtle. And, and many things, many things are much easier to understand if you do a holographic model. So let's see, that's my standard holographic model for anomalous transport. Uh, and here we can be very simple-minded. We know that holography works in five dimensions if I'm interested in four-dimensional field theories, which have anomalies. So I just add a five-dimensional John Simons term, and then that depends on the gauge field, A, and a couple here, uh, this F wedge F or FF dual, and here I couple it to a sort of gravitational R and R dual. So that's the curvature tensor, <coughs> Riemann curvature tensor. And then if I do a gauge variation, uh, I reproduce, that, that becomes a total derivative, and uh, I get the action is invariant up to a boundary term, and this boundary term is precisely what you would expect of an anomaly. So this is the usual chiral anomaly, which is basically electric field, the 
in a product of electric field with magnetic field, and this is sort of the gravitational analog. And the couplings here always will be kappa and lambda. And theta is the gauge parameter. So this is how we implement anomalies in, in these uh, ADS models. And so without going further into the derivation of this, if you apply this to uh, ADS black holes, uh, at which uh, you can think of the dual field theory being at finite temperature and the finite chemical potential, then like this has been pioneered actually by Johanna. So if you do that, you find to some surprise, I guess, that uh, there is sort of this spontaneous generation of, of uh, currents. In a magnetic field, you generate a, a charge current, and or you also generate uh, an energy current, uh, and you also can generate these currents by rotation. So this is the so-called chiral vortical effect, and this is a chiral magnetic effect. So both appear in the charge current and in the energy current. Uh, and there's another very striking pattern that appears. So this uh, anomaly coefficient for the, for the usual chiral anomaly always appears paired with the chemical potential. So it's kappa times mu, kappa times mu squared, kappa times mu squared, and so on. Uh, and the, the lambda, the coefficient for the uh, gravitational anomaly always appears with temperature squared. <coughs> So it's probably in, uh, necessary to say that part of these formulas have been known before, but the interpretation was very, very, uh, I would say, unclear. And I think holography has contributed a lot to properly understand the meaning of this, for example, that they, that they appear in hydrodynamics, that they're universal, that they're directly related to the anomalies. Uh, and one of the things before, before doing holography, uh, what people said is, well, the, this type of anomaly isn't interesting for transport. So if you look at the transport formulas, so they are all expressions which involve one derivative. So there's one derivative on the gauge field, one derivative on the fluid velocity. Uh, and, and the anomaly here is two derivatives. So that's, that's sort of fine in this derivative counting. But the gravitational anomaly is actually high order. It's fourth order in derivatives. And so from this uh, derivative counting argument, you would say, well, this has no chance to contribute to transport at this low order derivatives, like when you have magnetic field or vorticity. And uh, holography uh, actually immediately tells you that, uh, that, that there is something which is probably not completely correct with this argument, because you have to actually take a five-dimensional covariant uh, curvature tensor. And if you decompose this into the four-dimensional part and the part which looks into the holographic direction, then you get a second term from this anomaly, which depends not on the intrinsic curvature of the boundary uh, space, but on the extrinsic curvature and how this boundary space is embedded into anti de Sitter space. Uh, so roughly speaking, this extrinsic curvature is the, the R derivative in this holographic direction of the, of the boundary metric. And if you, if you assume an asymptotically anti de Sitter space, so this goes to zero, you can check that it actually goes to zero on the boundary, but it does not necessarily vanish in the interior. So this suggests there's a sort of low energy anomaly. If you want the divert, it's just the anomaly again, uh, has to have this form. And now you can calculate what's this extrinsic curvature in your favorite uh, space time, which is a, a black hole metric. And not only it's a black hole, I make it slowly rotating with this uh, gravitomagnetic field here. So it's a slowly rotating black hole. And I value this term, uh, then I find this expression. And this expression is a very nice interpretation that, uh, so F prime is actually, as Hawking told us, that's the temperature squared. Then the derivative of this field is, uh, you can think of gravitoelectric field. And the curl of this gravitomagnetic field is the gravitomagnetic field. So, so this thing takes this form. And lo and behold, it looks like an anomaly, except that now the coupling constant is temperature squared. The electric field is the gravitoelectric field. And the magnetic field is the gravitomagnetic field. So it has actually very much the same structure. Except that now you can, you can substitute the gravity, this goes back very ancient to Luttinger, very ancient ideas of relating gravity already with uh, temperature and thermal transport. Uh, Luttinger has actually this interesting footnote in one of his papers where he says, if general relativity wouldn't be invented for, for describing gravity, it should be invented for calculating thermal transport coefficients. So you can substitute the... Uh, gravitoelectric field for the gradient of temperature and the gravitomagnetic field for rotation, and then you find actually just the chiral vortical effect. 
So that's how holography manages to convert these uh, too many derivatives into, into an effective first order derivative. Uh, yeah? But this is a pure horizon effect, so you can calculate this on, on the horizon. Yeah, this, you can calculate this just on the horizon. And then you can set up some RG flow equation to transport it out with the boundary. Yeah. So. And recently there was a very nice paper by Mike Stone and Kim, which sort of gave a purely four dimensional argument, but they also rely on sort of the presence of a Euclidean uh, black hole, in, or actually even a Lorentzian black hole in space. But I, I think I don't have time to go into this. So, so you can, this sort of what you have learned from, from ADS CFT, you can do in a purely four dimensional context as well. Okay, now what is remarkable about this, uh, um, e yeah, these transport equations, yeah, I forgot to say this. Let's go back here. So we know that anomalies are something which are intrinsic to the theory. So they describe the theory, they are given by the couplings of the theory. And we all know in quantum field theory books, if you read, the anomalies are independent of the state in which you evaluate these amplitudes. So it's a bit surprising that here you find something which depends on the state. The chemical potential and the temperature are clearly state variables that describe not the theory, but the state in which the theory is. So what this means is that if you are able to drive the system in a particular state, which is at equilibrium or close to equilibrium, which you can describe by a chemical potential or a temperature, then you actually can probe something as subtle as, say, this, this transport coefficient, which is related to the gravitational anomaly. So the alternative experiment in high energy would be to monitor the decay of the pion into two gravitons, which is basically hopeless because of the weakness of gravitational interactions. But here, in this condensed matter context, you can actually perform thermal transport measurements and get effects from this, from this, uh, from this coupling, from this current. Okay. Now the, the other thing is okay. I forgot to say one more thing. Um, this is a current and this is a magnetic field. And so naively you would say, okay, so what's the point? What's the deal? Because we all know that an electric field makes a current. That's Ohm's law. But this is different. If you go back to now, it's a bit too loud. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is different in the sense that. Um, if you go back and remember your uh, electrodynamics classes, you learned that the magnetic field doesn't do any work on a system. The electric field does work. It pumps energy into the system. The magnetic field doesn't. So, so the resolution to this is sort of a puzzle, and the resolution to this is that these are actually dissipationless currents. So you can, you can also ask how much entropy is generated by these currents, and it turns out they don't generate entropy. So one of the things you can ask, can you test this more directly? Put some obstacles into the flow and look if the flow is modified by obstacles. And in holography, there's a very nice method of doing this, namely by this uh, linear axion backgrounds, which you can implement by a massless scalar, giving a massless scalar a, a profile like this, and say in the x direction here. Uh, and, and that has the effect that it breaks translation invariant, so it, it, it lifts the mode which allows the, the, the fluid to flow without any, well, if it's translation invariant, you can just go to a frame where you think, where the fluid flows. But once you have switched on this background, this massless scalar field, this linear profile, then this, this uh, uniform flow becomes massive, and it costs you actually energy to move that fluid. So, so you lift this degeneracy, and now you can, you can ask uh, what's happening to this, uh, to this anomalous transport phenomenon. And there are two things you could say. First, you could say, well, the charge, so this TCRI in a relativistic theory, so TCRI you call probably the, the energy current, where it, this is momentum density. And so what's, what's broken is momentum density, because that's, the, that's what makes the, that's the conserved charge. And so, the question is, so I have broken the charge by this background, and so you would think there is a, a modification to the anomalous transport. On the other hand, it's also the energy current, and as a current, you would think it's dissipationless. So it's a little bit of a puzzle, and intuition doesn't clearly tell you what's going on. But you can do the holographic calculation and go, uh, go through the uh, 
the formalism, but a, a little bit unusual here is that there is this, for me at least, slightly unusual power in this black hole metric. Usually the mass of the black hole only comes in here at 1 over r to the 4. Here it comes at 1 over r squared. And that has the effect that you have to be very careful when you, when you calculate your energy momentum tensor in holography. So you have to vary the metric. And I told you already this extrinsic uh, curvature on the boundary is extremely important to capture the effects of this uh, gravitational anomaly term. And actually, it's a higher derivative. So you have to treat this as a sort of independent variable and vary independently with respect to it. And then it turns out that this object, where u is also a, a tensor that depends on the extrinsic curvature, that's the actual uh, tensor. That's the usual uh, energy momentum tensor, which you get from variation with respect to the metric. And that's this new term, which you get from correction with respect to the extrinsic curvature. And it turns out only this sum uh, has the right water density to be an energy momentum tensor. And now if you calculate the response, say, to rotation and magnetic fields, if you don't, if you don't include that term, you actually do find uh, a contribution, a modification in this, in this particular transport, uh, which is proportional to this graviton mass, to the breaking of, of, of a momentum uh, conservation. But if you use the energy momentum tensor that also has the correct water density, then this breaking goes away, and you just see that, that you can crank up the breaking of translation invariance as much as you want, and the energy current stays completely untouched by this. So it's a clear sign of this dissipationless na nature. So, so it's like this quantum skier. It doesn't see the obstacle. It just goes around it. OK, then, uh, so the, one of the original applications of this is the so-called current magnetic effect in heavy ion collisions. There, the idea is that in heavy ion collisions, you collide, well, heavy ions, but they don't collide just centrally. Sometimes, most of the time, they just overlap partially. Then in the middle, you create this fireball, which eventually becomes the core gluon plasma. And there's also this complicated uh, vacuum structure of QCD. And uh, the idea is, very early on, there's a lot of energy in a small volume, such that you could uh, just jump over this uh, over this peak here in the energy spectrum and change winding number. And by the axial anomaly of the QCD, that would change chirality of your quarks in the quark gluon plasma. And so it might be that this quark gluon plasma that is created has some, some chiral imbalance. This chiral imbalance is statistically distributed. So sometimes it's more left, sometimes it's more right. It's difficult to measure statistically. But the signature would be that these guys are also positively charged. They create a magnetic field. And then this chiral magnetic effect becomes uh, comes into, into play and would separate charges. You would find more positive charges up here than down there. And, and one of the big questions is uh, how long does it take for what's the time scale? So, for example, we know that the magnetic field decays very quickly because it's generated by these spectators which pass by. So very quickly the magnetic field is decayed. And the question is, is this already in equilibrium, which I can describe by chemical potential? and temperature. So that's again, then that, that addresses the question. Um, these, that as I have emphasized before, chemical potential and temperature are sort of uh, state parameters, but they characterize the state of thermal equilibrium or very close to thermal equilibrium. What happens when you are very far from equilibrium? And again, that's a question you can, you can address in holography. So you can think about doing some sort of uh, quenching the chiral magnetic effect. Uh, and, and that's something we did recently. Um, and what we, what we concentrated on, again, was this uh, gravitational John Simons term, where we wanted to see our setup was we take a black hole in onto the sitter space, we throw in some additional stuff, a scalar field, say, which is just energy and no other charge. That, of course, will increase the temperature of the black hole, but only asymptotically, because the temperature is defined only when you are in, in equilibrium. And we want to see how much of this, uh, how, how long does it take for this chiral magnetic response to build up to go into equilibrium or the full, get the full equilibrium uh, response? How, how am I doing this time? 10 minutes? OK. So the story is actually quite complicated because, again, here we don't break translation invariance. We keep translation invariance. And then what we want to monitor is the response in, in the generation of this momentum current. 
But momentum is conserved. So if I start with a situation which has no momentum, I cannot change that if I don't introduce momentum. But what will happen is there is this non-dissipative part. As I said before, there is this non-dissipative part of, of energy flow or momentum uh, density. And if the temperature increases, this will increase. But that has to be counteracted by a usual dissipative flow. And that I can easily measure by sprinkling some color on top of this fluid. And the dissipative flow will draw, drag the, the, the color with it. And that's actually my observable. So I look to this, to this uh, so a, a sort of tracer charge. And in the holographic setup, there is an additional gauge field, which I call X, and that's this tracer charge. So that monitors, uh, in this indirect way, it monitors how much of this, of this uh, non-dissipative flow is built up by seeing uh, how it's counterbalanced by the dissipative one, the one which I can monitor. Okay, so, and then what I want to, to understand is, in the time evolution of this, can I describe this by an effective equilibrium theory or something which is close to equilibrium, which would be hydrodynamics. So I can model the whole process by just doing hydrodynamics. Here are the hydrodynamic constitutive relations with current magnetic uh, uh, transport coefficients here and there. And then I just assume that the pump energy, the, 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 the temperature increases, and I try to calculate how much of this spectator, of this tracer charge is moving, how much tracer current in this tracer charge do I get. You can do this holographic, this, this, um, this calculation for, in the holographic model, and you find a curve which has sort of, at least for a conformal theory, it has this nice temperature dependence and has a characteristic peak here at one quarter. So if the system is always describable by some effective temperature, even if it's far from equilibrium, but if, if it would be possible to describe it, then at every moment at the time evolution, uh, my current curve that I can measure in my quench experiment should lie on this curve somewhere. Okay. So what's really happening? So for very, okay. That's, yeah, so that's very, for, and that's indeed sort of what's happening, but for very, very slow quenches. So you have to throw in your additional scalar field over a very long time. And then you see the buildup of this, of this current and the slower you get, the closer it gets to this maximum. So indeed, you, you can find this curve, but you have to be very, very slow, really adiabatically slow, uh, injecting energy very, very slow. More interesting to us is what, what's happening when you when you quench the system very rapidly, if you, if you introduce charge at a very, very, uh, not charge, energy at a very, very short time scale, and then look how long does it take for the current to build up. And then, ah, oh, this almost cannot be seen. Uh, here there is a small shaded area which goes from something like c minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. It's this curve where this curve is not constant. That's the scalar field profile. So it's a massless scalar. If, if, if the scalar is constant, this, it completely decouples. So it doesn't do anything. Energy is injected into the system only here in this very short time range. And that's the response in this current, which is sensitive to the buildup of non-dissipative uh, chiromagnetic energy current. And as you see, there's no chance you could, you could ever model this by an effective hydrodynamic description. So here, the energy is completely injected into the system and the current stays basically zero long time afterwards. And then it starts building up and, and finally it reaches at, at some, and that's actually then a sort of universal time scale at 1.2 T times temperature, T is the time, it reaches sort of its equilibrium value. And that's, if the, if the quench is short enough, that time scale is sort of uh, universal. T is the final temperature. So that indicates, uh, at least we take this as an indication that these transport formulas are really effective only if you are sufficiently close to equilibrium. So, oops. Hope you're fine. Okay. <coughs> of course, that's, that's just the first study and we have to, to, to do more, more, more work on this, but um, it's an indication that indeed you have to drive the system in a state which is very close to equilibrium in order to see this effect. And finally, uh, you can also, you can also uh, do a sort of strongly coupled model for a type of material which are called wild semi-metals. And 
So these are sort of three-dimensional uh, analogs of graphene. So here's a sketch how the band structure looks like. So here there's, a, there's an upper band and the lower band, and there's some region where they cross. And around this, this linear, this band crossing points, you can expand in the, in the momentum, the pseudo momentum around these points. And here basically you have a two-level system, and the two-level system has generically the Hamiltonian of poly matrices times parameters, and the parameters are three momenta. So you get the Hamiltonian, which is sigma in P. And then there's a theorem which goes back to people when they started lattice theory back in the 80s, Nielsen and Ninomiya, which tells you that the sign of the sigma matrices at this point has always to be the opposite of the sign of the sigma matrices at that point. And in high energy languages, that means that the effective low energy uh, fermions that live at this intersection point have opposite chirality from the fermions that live here. So this is how you can realize three-dimensional chiral fermions in a condensed matter uh, setup if, if the Fermi level is close to this band crossing points. And you effectively get theory of left-handed and right-handed fermions. And then you can vary parameters in this model. And if you, there are actually two parameters. So one parameter wants to drag these wild points apart. And the other parameter is basically a mass term. It wants to gap the system. So if the mass term wins, the system is gapped, and there's, so to speak, no interest in physics. It's an insulator. Well, it's, it's probably a topological insulator, so there's interesting physics still on the boundary. Uh, but what interest, what's, what's also interesting is this state, which is just at the, at the end. The first thing you can do is, how do you measure the, this? How do you distinguish this state from this state? And the canonical way of looking to this is asking if this thing has an anomalous Hall effect. So here, anomalous is in the sense of condensed matter. It means having a Hall effect without applying an external magnetic field. But it's also in the sense of high energy, because it's actually, oh, now I've switched notation from kappa to alpha. I'm sorry. That should be kappa as well. So it's, it's again, an effect induced by the anomaly. And this A5 set is the parameter. The dashed line is a weak coupling field theory model, and the solid lines are a holographic model, and this uh, sort of at finite temperature, there is a sharp quantum phase transition and it gets smeared out at finite temperature. So you can cook up a holographic model on that. And more details will be presented by, in a postdoc by Hauke later today. Uh, but we were very much interested in, in this critical state where there's just this bent touching going on. And on general reasons, there is enough symmetry breaking in the system to expect something to happen to, 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 to give a new transport coefficient. And this new transport coefficient is, is a so-called odd viscosity. Uh, actually, it has been classified already in Lando Lifshitz. Here are the response formulas. These are the stresses. These are the usual viscosities. So for un you need anisotropy. So I have to say that this bend touching happens only in one direction, say in the C direction. In the other two directions, it's still linear. Uh, so it's an anisotropic system, and this anisotropic system breaks also time reversal invariance, and that allows to have these new viscosity coefficients. And these viscosity coefficients are also non-dissipative transport coefficients. So in theory, they can be there. The question is, are they there? And so we look to our holographic model. Ah, okay. I tried to make pictures. This. Uh, this is the, uh, the simpler one, which is sort of acting in a plane. You move, you put your spoon in the fluid, you move it like this, and you build up pressure, which goes like this and like this. So, uh, and then there is some genuine three-dimensional uh, viscosity, which is difficult to visualize. So I think I don't have time to go into this. But when you do the calculation in the model, and if and only if you add again this gravitational trans Simons term to your action, then in the quantum critical region, so you heat the system up at finite temperature. In the quantum critical region, you do, in fact, find these two whole viscosities. Here's this uh, eta parallel and this eta, eta orthogonal in eta parallel. So that's sort of, again, since this is related to an anomaly present in the original system, you would think that's also sort of a universal response coefficient. And it might be that uh, uh, that gives you some sort of prediction uh, from holography for the physics of these critical wild semimetals. Of course, that has to be substantiated with a, with a 
say, a weak coupling calculation, which can also be done. If it's universal, it should be that weak coupling as well. We hope that the paper will come out soon. The calculation is done. But. Okay, and again, the gravitational anomaly has done this, this uh, amazing thing again. It has uh, give you, given you a response at first order. So here it's even a bit more complicated to understand, but in holography we again can trace it back to this extrinsic curvature uh, contributions. Okay, that's it. Uh, I guess everybody here knows, don't have to convince you, that holography is really a very efficient tool for discovering new transport phenomena. Uh, you can start many, many interesting questions like see really this dissipationless nature. Uh, but there are also questions which still have to be answered. For example, what's the role of the intrinsic curvature? What is it in field theory? I think everything you compute in holography has to have a quantum field theory correspondence. There must be something there in quantum field theory which, which does exactly the same thing. So this is still not, at least I don't understand it. Uh, there is a question, you know, all these anonymous transport coefficients depend on equilibrium uh, parameters like chemical potential temperature. How efficient are they when you are very far from equilibrium? That's again something that can be addressed and first uh, results I've shown you. And then there is this uh, curious thing of odd viscosity. Again, this is sort of anomalous odd viscosity. It's known that such odd viscosity exists if you apply external magnetic fields, but that is completely without external magnetic field. So, okay, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so, Carl, uh, about this question, that was precisely one thing I was going to ask. So, this extrinsic curvature is the one of the boundary in your case, in your system? Questions? Uh, so, Carl, uh, about this question, that was precisely one thing I was going to ask. So, this extrinsic curvature is the one of the boundary in your case, in your system? Well, it's how the, yeah, how the boundary is embedded in ADS space. So, could it be thought that your boundary field theory is on a curved space? Should it be thought that way? No, no. The extrinsic curvature is non-zero even if you're in flat space. I see. Yeah. Okay. You can be happy in flat space. The intrinsic curvature is zero, but the extrinsic curvature measures how, you, how flat space changes as you move inside ADS. Okay. And that is correct. Okay. okay. Any further questions? So in the last uh, slide where you had the, well, not the previous, where you had the odd viscosities. Uh, this one? Yeah. So you have two because you are breaking rotational invariance, no? Yes, yes. But in principle, there could be three independent odd viscosities. Do you understand why I there is only two? I two holes. There are three shear, but two holes. No, there can be three odd. Ah, uh, yes, but that, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, that could be, but there's some symmetry in work which relates two of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, st you still have rotations in the plane. Okay. Maybe so. It's basically the way we calculate the energy momentum tensor, it's symmetric. And I think the third one would assume that we don't have the symmetric energy momentum mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. All right, so in view of time, I would uh, refer any other questions to the coffee break. Let's thank Carl again for this very nice talk.